Thank you very much, colleagues. The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. And in dealing with this bill, members should have with them the bill as amended at Stage 2, the Marshall List and the groupings of amendments. And uh, should there be a vote this afternoon, the division bell will sound, proceedings will be suspended for five minutes following the first division in the afternoon. And uh, thereafter, sorry, the period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. And thereafter, there'll be a one minute period for uh, the first division after debate. Members who wish to speak in any debate on any group of amendments should press their request to keep button as soon as possible after I call the group. So this stage will turn to the marshal's list and I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 2, Minister to move Amendment 1 and speak to both amendments in the group. In moving Amendment 1, I'd like to thank Lewis MacDonald and David Stewart for bringing forward amendments at Stage 2, which related to the duties of Scottish Ministers to provide information and raise awareness about authorisation and tra for transplantation. Amendment 1 draws together the overall intention of Mr Macdonald and Mr Stewart's Stage 2 amendments by setting out how Ministers are to carry out their new duty under Section 11D of the Human Tissue Scotland Act 2006. That provision places a duty on Scottish Ministers to promote information and awareness about how transplantation may be authorised, including in particular how authorisation for transplantation may be deemed to be given. The effect of Amendment 1 will be that this duty must be carried out at least once in every calendar year. It will also mean that when the duty is exercised, Scottish Ministers must have regard to the need to provide information to the public about how authorisation of transplantation may be deemed to be given and how to give an express authorisation or to make, out, to make an opt-out declaration. The amendment makes it clear that the Scottish Ministers must have regard to the need to provide this information in healthcare settings. Um, this could include, for example, providing information in GP surgeries or hospital waiting areas in line with the intention of Mr Stewart's amendment at stage two. Amendment two is consequential on amendment one. I therefore ask members to support amendments one and two. Thank you very much. And I call Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I welcome the Minister's amendment, which fulfils his commitment to refine the text of amendments passed by the Health and Sport Committee at Stage 2, and I welcome his willingness to seek an agreement on this area. As he says, uh, that's Amendment 1, and Amendment 2 is consequential on that. My amendment at Stage 2 was to commit Ministers to an annual uh, campaign to raise awareness of both deemed and express authorisation and opting out. David Stewart's amendment was to commit the NHS to communicate with patients about authorisation and opting out. Uh, I'm glad the Minister has engaged with Mr Stewart and myself on these matters and his amendment here, or these two amendments, deliver on his commitment uh, given at stage two and I therefore look forward to supporting both the amendments in this group. Thank you very much. And does the Minister wish to add anything by way of conclusion? Nothing further. Thank you very much. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Could I call Amendment 2 and ask the Minister to move formally? Moved formally. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, grouped with Amendment 4. Lewis MacDonald to move Amendment 3 and speak to both amendments in this group. Thank you very much. The purpose of Amendment 3 is to require Ministers to review and report on the new system of authorisation five years after it comes into force including a review of the government's actions to raise awareness of the changes under the bill in general. The Health and Sport Committee unanimously agreed this approach in supporting an amendment in my name at stage two. Amendment three refines that approach uh, and amendment four is consequential. I'm grateful to the Minister again for working with me on these amendments and I believe that they deliver the shared purpose of the government and the Health and Sport Committee. Amendment 3 provides that Ministers must review both the new arrangements for deemed authorisation and their own actions to promote information and awareness about the revised system of organ donation. The, remote, the report must say whether the objectives of this bill have been met and whether family members have had the support that they need. This will allow Ministers and Parliament to make a judgment five years after implementation about whether the bill before us today has made the difference, which we hope that it will. Uh, and if not, uh, what more at that stage might need to be done? And I move Amendment 3 in my name. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister. 
Um, I support amendments three and four lodged by Lewis MacDonald and would like to thank him for working with the Scottish Government to ensure that the proposals align with the overall aim of the Bill. Thank you very much. And no other member wishes to speak. Does Mr MacDonald wish to add anything? I do not. Thank you very much. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 4. Lewis MacDonald to move. To move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes consideration of amendment stage. Members will be delighted to hear. Now, be before we move on to the debate at Stage 3 on the Human Tissue Bill, uh, as members will be aware at this point in proceedings, I have to make a, a statement to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system or franchise for the Scottish parliamentary elections. In my view, it does no such thing. Therefore, it does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. So we'll turn to the stage three debate and the next item... Uh, and I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate on stage three of the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on the Minister, Joe Fitzpatrick. Presiding Officer, I welcome the opportunity to open this stage three debate on the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. I'm proud to have led this bill through the Parliament, but I want to start by recognising the work of my predecessors in relation to this bill, but also in relation to wider improvements in the transplantation landscape. Since the early days of this parliament, there has been much discussion about the pros and cons of moving to an opt-out system. Um, so at this point, I want to put on record my thanks to the bill team and officials who have um, got us to the stage of having a bill, which I am clear um, will be a positive addition to the work which has also delivered so much progress over the past decade. I'd also like to thank the Health and Sport Committee for its consideration and sensitive approach to the scrutiny of the bill, reflecting their understanding of the circumstances in which organ and tissue donation must take place as a result of the incredible generosity of donors and their family. I also want to thank other members for taking the time to discuss their concerns with me particularly Mike Rumbles, Jeremy Balfour, Gordon Lyndhurst, who lodged amendments at stage two, facilitating further refinement, discussion and clarification of the operation of the bill. Presiding officer, there is no one answer to increasing organ and tissue donation. And that is why we must continue to build on the measures which have been put in place over the last 13 years and to which this bill con contributes. The primary aim of the bill is to introduce an opt-out system of op organ and tissue donation for deceased donors. The bill amends the existing Scottish legislation that supports donation, that is the 2006 Human Tissue Scotland Act, by introducing a new additional form of authorisation called deemed authorisation. In practice, this means that, uh, what this means is that where a person aged 16 or over was not known to have any objection to donation donation may proceed. However, the bill also contains safeguards for those who would not have the capacity to understand deemed authorisation or people uh, residing in Scotland for less than 12 months who may not be aware of the system, who will not be subject to deemed authorisation. Key to the success of donation are donor families and the way in which families are approached is a key part of that. The bill ensures that the interests and the views of the donor are safeguarded at all times by including a clear and effective mechanism to do this. There is a duty on health workers to make inquiries of families and others who are entitled to provide information reflecting the most recent uh, views of the donor. I know that the committee was given a demonstration by the specialist nurses for organ donation on how the approach is made to families and saw the sensitive and supportive way that the family is guided through the process at such a difficult time. This is a real strength of the current system and that approach will continue under the new system. There is a high awareness of donation in Scotland and one of the areas which has raised a lot of discussion in committee and during the stage one debate is the importance of information and awareness. I welcome that the duties to promote information and awareness in the bill have been strengthened by the amendments developed in collaboration with Lewis MacDonald and David Stewart. 
and I want to reiterate to the Chamber our intention um, and commitment to fulfil those duties. We are committed to an awareness raising campaign for at least 12 months during the lead up to the introduction of the opt out system. We will take time in the lead up uh, to that period to work with communications experts and representative groups to ensure that information is accessible to different groups in the population, including hard to reach groups, minority groups and those with specific needs. In addition to the multimedia activity being planned, there will be a direct mailing to all households in Scotland in the lead up to the introduction of the system. This will explain the change in law, including, amongst other things, how a person can opt in or opt out of donation. The secondary school education pack, which is highly regarded as good practice, will also be updated and disseminated. We are also exploring how information can be provided to young people reaching 16 years of age so that they are aware of the opt-out system and can make an informed choice about their donation decision. We will continue to work with Kidney Research UK to train the volunteer peer educators who are a valuable resource, raising awareness of donation and transplantation amongst ethnic minority groups. In this respect, I am delighted that Kidney Research UK have been invited officials to speak about the opt-out system in July at their conference with imams to raise awareness about donation and transplantation. This bill makes an important contribution to developments in donation and transplantation and I want to thank the experts in the NHS who have guided us through the sensitive and complex issues of the process, working with us to develop a legal framework for authorisation for donation that respects this. As we move towards introduction of the opt-out system, we'll be working with the NHS to ensure that the NHS systems are developed and, th and those working in donation and transplantation have the necessary guidance and training needed to deliver the new system safely and successfully. The work to increase donation and transplantation will not stop with the passing of this bill. As less than 1% of the population will die in, in circumstances where donation is possible, it is important that we continue to find different ways to make progress. In closing, I want to be clear when we talk about progress, what that means to the lives of those awaiting transplant. Members might not, be, might not know the name of Gordon Hutchison, but they might recognise him from his scar. Gordon has featured as part of the donation campaign in Scotland for the last six years. Since his transplant as a child, he has gone on to live a full life. He has married and recently become a proud father of a baby girl. On his transplant, Gordon has said, the life I lived before the heart transplant compared to my life now is night and day. My organ donor saved my life. Presiding officer, for the many people awaiting a life-changing transplantation operation, I move that the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call on Miles Briggs to open for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And for the many families and campaigners across Scotland, today is an incredibly important day. Every day in the UK, three people die waiting for a new organ. In Scotland, as been outlined already, 500 people are currently waiting for a transplant that will and could save their lives. Across the UK, Scotland has the highest proportion of people on the organ donor register, but has the lowest rate of family consent and also the lowest rate of organ donation. Now, given the gift of life is an extraordinarily special thing for someone to do following uh, the death of a family member. And I would like to pay tribute, as the minister has, um, to those who have already taken the decision not only to join the organ donor register, but the work uh, that their family have to undertake to make sure that uh, their wishes are taken forward. And that is at heart what we are trying to achieve today, to make it easier for an individual to express their personal wishes and to start a national conversation on organ donation. And I'd like to pay tribute to those who have also worked on the bill, both, both um, in past parliaments as well as in this parliament, including Anne McTaggart and Mark Griffin. I'd also like to thank those who have given evidence and met with the committee, um, the Health and Sport Committee, during the course of our inquiries. 
And I think I speak for all members of the committee when I say their personal experiences um, have stayed with us and helped to take forward and shape suggestions to how we believe as a committee the bill can be strengthened and improved. And key to success of the organ donation, of any organ donation, as the Minister's outlined, is the experiences of families and friends um, that can ultimately help improve um, decisions and actually the experience at what is the hardest time for anyone, anyone can imagine. Presiding officer, during our time in scrutinising the bill in Parliament, the experience in Wales was raised repeatedly and it's clear that there have been significant positive progresses made in Wales and that can be helping to change and improve our own system here in Scotland. In Wales, family consent has increased from less than 49% to 70% following the introduction of an opt-out system in 2015. This is welcome progress and I hope we will see the same realised soon here in Scotland. Signing officer, there is a specific issue, though, which I hope uh, members still um, believe needs to be addressed in relation to the provision of intensive care beds across the country, especially in Highland and south of Scotland. Scotland has the lowest number of intensive care beds anywhere in the United Kingdom. I know this was an issue highlighted by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh at stage two, and I know my health and sport committee colleague, David Stewart, has also raised this issue. Now, during, as the bill has progressed, both of us, um, I think we're mindful to try to bring forward amendments with regards to this in the bill, um, but I don't think that would have been useful or appropriate for this bill. It's an issue I still feel, though, we need to see further discussion and clarity around on the Scottish Government's commitment and further proposals, as this will ultimately, I believe, affect the potential success of the bill. Now, I welcome the Minister's constructive approach to working with the committee on this issue, but I'd also like to see further details and assessment of future staffing and provision of intensive care beds and a commitment to keep this under review as the bill goes forward. Um, when I've met with people who've received a donation, the clear message that they give me is they believe that the collaborative approach between the organ donation teams and families has literally made a life-saving impact. And I'd like to also add uh, what the minister said to thank them for their work. Um, one donor can sa save up to nine lives and transform even more by donating tissue. Thanks to the generosity of donors, their families, and the work of our NHS, we've seen great progress on organ donation over the last few years. And I hope the minister will provide um, and make sure that the, the campaign he's outlined is innovative and positive so that we can have a positive public information campaign that, that will actually capture the positive spirit of what it is to, to be a donor and what the families um, have expressed during our time during the committee. Because um, we need to work to continue to progress and increase donor numbers and save the lives of more people across Scotland and the UK. And I believe this bill can and will deliver on those two main aims, to further increase donor numbers while honouring donors' decisions and, and the decision they've taken during their life. Presiding officer, I know from speaking to those who've received an organ and their families just how incredibly thankful they are to individuals and donors and also their wider family. It genuinely is sometimes a situation that cannot be put into words by um, donors and their families. And what it means for someone's son or daughter um, to have been saved by a total stranger. I hope the passing of this legislation today will help take forward a positive national conversation for donors as well. Finally, I'd like to conclude with the words of 57-year-old uh, Steve Donaldson from Largs in North Ayrshire, who had a heart transplant in 2010 after suffering, suffering severe heart failure. He waited nine months on the organ donor transplant list before a suita, suitable donor was found and in the briefing provided uh, by the British Heart Foundation for today's debate uh, Steve said my message to everyone is please sign the organ donor register have the conversation with your family about your wishes it can really make a difference presiding officer as a parliament we are currently debating and passing so many pieces of legislation not as efficiently as we have today maybe but none however can be so important and make such a life-changing impact than the passing of the Human Tissue Bill today. And I think that's something we should all rightly be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on David Stewart to open for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And this, of course, is crucial legislation. How do we raise the level of organ donation in Scotland to match the needs of those desperately awaiting transplantation? The principles of this bill have been broadly accepted across the political divide, 
notwithstanding the lodging of a number of amendments designed to improve and indeed develop the legislation. So I acknowledge the help of the Minister uh, and his officials with my amendment, which is now in Joe Fitzpatrick's name, uh, but I could stress that no copyright fee is required in this situation. Um, Scottish Labour have long been supportive of soft opt-out for organisation and we're glad to see that Scotland is finally moving to adopt such a system. Now credit should be given to the individuals from across the political divide who have consistently campaigned for this change. In particular, we are thanks to Scottish Labour's Anne McTaggart for her proposed Members' Bill in the last session, which, although unsuccessful, significantly moved the debate forward. And I would like to personally acknowledge the contribution of, uh, of, of Mark, who has done such a fantastic contribution in this as well. And I know he's got a big family uh, relationship there. So it's Mark Griffin, of course. Uh, Wales, of course, have led the way in this issue. And though it's still relatively early to assess the impact, there are positive signs of increased levels of family consent and donation. We must learn from the experience of implementation in Wales, including the importance, as the Minister said, of resourcing the public awareness and information campaigns. Now, Scottish Labour's successful amendments at stage two have raised the awareness raising element of the bill by requiring annual campaigns. We also established a five-year assessment of changes so that there's a clear learning on the effectiveness of implementation and improvements in organ transplantation. However, the bill will not be the only change. This bill will not be the only change needed to increase transplantation rates in Scotland. Going forward, the Scottish Government need to ensure that there's sufficient investment in Scotland's infrastructure to support the uh, increase in organ donation. As we've heard from previous speakers, including the Minister, 426 patients died in the UK whilst on the transplant list or within one year of removal in 2018. And as we heard from Miles Briggs, Scotland is the highest percentage of people on the organ donation register, but the lowest actual organ donation in terms of rates per million. Family authorisation also is low in Scotland. So the key issue, presiding officer, is the gap between those who wish to donate organs and the number who actually go on to join the organ donation register. 80% support donation, but only 52% have signed up to donation uh, register. So in simplistic terms, the purpose of the bill is to bridge the divide, to encourage those who support organ, organ donation but haven't registered no DR to have their wishes uh, recorded and respected. And let me tell you about my friend Gary. He is in his mid-50s and lives in Gunlossus in Fife. Nearly two years ago, he was given the gift of life by a crucially needed heart transplant. Prior to that, he was in the transplant list for 12 months and had a pacemaker, but he slowly deteriorated. Without the transplant, he would have died. Gary cannot praise enough to dedicate support of the nursing staff at the Golden Jubilee. He said to me, it was a matter of life or death. We also need to look at international evidence and best practice. That's absolutely crucial. Now, we know from the background research by the British Heart Foundation that people living in countries with soft opt-out were more willing to donate their organs. So in general terms, soft opt-out means that unless the deceased has expressed a wish in life not to be an organ donor, consent will be assumed. Now, of the top countries, the top 10 countries in terms of donors, per million, nine have an opt-out system. Now, as I mentioned at the stage one, this brings us to Spain, who lead the World League table for organ donations. Now, we took evidence at the Health and Support Committee in this point. Why are they so successful? And I know the Minister's got a big interest in this. Well, there's three main reasons. They have a comprehensive network of transplant coordinators, they have a donor detection programme, and they have a greater provision of intensive care beds. Could the Minister's wind up comment on this? Uh, bear in mind it's not a zero-sum game. We must also be concentrating on increasing the number of intensive care beds as well as looking at the changes uh, in consent. Now, very briefly, I'm conscious of time, officer. During the stage one debate, I spoke of two issues raised by the Law Society, and I raised this at the last issue, so the Minister has some advance warning. Um, they raised the issue, is deemed authorisation consistent with the Montgomery ruling, which is Montgomery versus NHS Lanarkshire, which was a Supreme Court case around informed consent. And is the bill consistent with the European Convention on Human Rights, specifically the case of Elbert versus Latvia, 2015, which was found to be a breach of Article 8, which is the right to privacy. However, I do believe, President Officer, that the five-year review will allow considered reflection on the above points. In practice in the future, what assessments made about medical professionals will in fact take into account the wishes of the whole family. However, I believe this is a vitally important piece of legislation 
and will be a matter of life and death for many Scots, like my friend Gary, desperate in need of life-saving organ donation. Uh, as Cabran um, once said, you give little when you give of your possessions. It's when you give of yourself that you truly give. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Alison Johnson to close for the Green, open for the Green Party. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I too, I'd like to begin by thanking all of those who have campaigned for this change over many years. Um, and I'd like to thank the RCN, the BMA, the British Heart Foundation and the Law Society of Scotland for their briefings for today. Um, but I also would like to express my gratitude as well to Mark Griffin for his lengthy campaigning on this issue and to Anne McTaggart for her work in introducing her, her bill in 2015. Um, although it ultimately didn't win support in Parliament, I think it's been a key impetus for change. The policy memorandum for the bill today reminds us that organ and tissue donation and transplantation is an incredible development in modern healthcare, which continues to save and to significantly improve lives. And the Greens strongly support the intent of this important bill. It also reminds us that organ and tissue donation and transplantation is dependent on the generosity, the commitment and the skill of a number of people. And I'd like to thank them all. We already know, we've heard in this debate again today, that Scotland does well in terms of donor registration and that 52% of people in Scotland have signed up to the organ donor registration, the register. But while this percentage is the highest in the UK, there is a persistent gap. David Stewart spoke of it um, strongly. That gap between this figure and the approximately 80% of people who support organ donation a new poll released today by the British Heart Foundation has also revealed that seven in 10 people in Scotland back the proposed changes to organ donation law. So the will to donate is clearly there. And I'm hopeful that this bill will help to tackle the disparity between people's intentions and the actual number of donations. Now, family authorization for organ donation in Scotland is the lowest in the UK. And this results in the loss of approximately 100 potential donors every year. And this bill can go some way towards rectifying this, as evidence from elsewhere in the UK suggests. In Wales, family approval for organ donation has increased from 49 to 72% since introduction of the opt-out system. And I'm therefore optimistic that a similar pattern will begin to emerge in Scotland and that the number of family consents will rise, which in turn will lead to an increase in donations. But during the stage one debate, I with others have highlighted that an opt-out system on its own isn't an instant solution. It has to be part of a broader strategy to increase donations. And I am pleased, therefore, to see a duty placed on Scottish ministers to annually provide information to the public about how to opt in or to opt out of the system. It's ultimately preferable to maximise the number of people opting in as this will remove any ambiguity about the patient's wishes and hopefully allay family members' concerns about going against these. And healthcare, healthcare professionals must also be given comprehensive guidance about the changes to organ donation proposed by this bill. The Royal College of Nursing has revealed that only 25% of its members feel they can speak with confidence about organ donation with patients and their families. So there's still much work to be done to raise awareness amongst healthcare professionals. The college has called for an education programme for all healthcare professionals, as well as ensuring that we have sufficient resources for education and training of the wider nursing workforce to support a shift in the culture of conversations on donations. It is really important that we empower our healthcare professionals to speak confidently to patients about organ donation and to address any concerns or fear that the change in legislation uh, may cause. I'd like to close by thanking the BMA for sharing a number of personal stories about organ, organ donation today. I'd like to focus on the words of Jill Hollis in particular. The lung transplant I received in 2004 took me from being close to death to living again. My transplant was the most amazing gift and I have nothing but gratitude for my donor family and the medical team. I'm hopeful that this bill will lead to more stories like Jill's and enable more people to give the gift of life. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Alex Cole Hamilton to open for the Liberal Democrats.
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, that keeper of organisational memory in parliamentary history, Mike Rumbles, remarked to me just a few moments ago that he thought that this stage three proceedings was some kind of record in uh, the swift a way in which we dispatched with all the amendments. And I think that speaks to the brevity of this proceeding, speaks to the consensus that has been built around this bill. Um, and as Alison Johnson said, however, it didn't happen in isolation. So I too want to reflect on the contribution, both of Anne McTaggart in the last session, and indeed Mark Griffin, who I think it's fair to say held our committee and the government's feet to the fire in the early days of this parliament to ensure that we got to this day. So I want to thank him uh, very much indeed for, for getting us to this point and indeed the government uh, for making good on their commitment to do so. It is an emotional day for me. It's a, a joyful one at that as well. When I was, as I said, at uh, stage one proceedings, when I was an aspirant political candidate, as I'm sure you all were one day as well, um, in Hastings we were often asked what your private member's bill would be if you made it to the Scottish Parliament. And as I said at stage one, Deputy Presiding Officer, this would be that bill. And that came from a lifetime of understanding about the needs of organ donation and the paucity of organ donation that has until now existed in this country. And that was because my good friend, Anders Gibson, who suffered from CF, um, I grew up alongside with an expectation that he, his life would always be cut short. It is to my great sadness that Anders didn't live to see this day, that his lung transplant, when it came, ultimately came too late and didn't properly take. But I speak in his memory today, and I know that he is looking down on us and uh, with, with great pleasure at what this parliament is about to do. Um, organ donation is, is vitally important. There isn't enough of it, and that is why I was keen to host a reception and a photo call earlier this year for Give a Kidney UK. They're a philanthropic kidney donation organization of people who give altruistically of healthy kidneys to complete strangers, completely out of the will to uh, be philanthropic and to give life to others who might have to suffer uh, protracted periods on dialysis or even life limitation. So I want to salute them in this debate today as well. But it is in the foothills of our preparation around this legislation that I learned the full extent of what actually goes in to the process of organ donation. And it was our great privilege, I'm sure I speak for all of the committee today, when I talk about our experience of meeting with the specialist organ donation nurses who are angels, heaven sent, and a credit to our National Health Service. They talked about using the rather onerous bureaucracy, which I think were, was quite shocking to members of the committee to see how many intimate questions were asked of uh, a soon-to-be deceased relative in their final hours by uh, loved ones literally at their bedside. But they talked about turning that process into the telling of a life story, into um, finding mirth and merriment in, in what for everyone concerned would be somewhat their darkest hours. We met with transplant recipients and I think that's when the idea of organ donation as being gift was really struck home. The, just the sheer mag magnitude of that present that somebody had given um, in the last hours of their life to that somebody, somebody unknown to them who would go on to live uh, a happy and fulfilling existence off the back of the organs that they received. But with that, we also learned about the roller coaster of emotions that goes with that. And Anders had that too. When he had a, a couple of false starts being driven to Newcastle and returned when uh, the, the transplant fell through. And I hope the minister will um, address those points in his remarks and talk about the mental health support that we can give to those people who are on transplant waiting lists. Um, we need to also to recognize that, that this is just one aspect in, in encouraging people to have those conversations, because those ha conversations are going to be absolutely important going alongside this bill. And if I can finish on this quote, uh, presiding officer, from the chief executive of the British Heart Foundation, Simon Gillespie, who said, um, this is about, uh, sorry, there is a desperate shortage of organ donations. Introducing an opt-out system will better reflect the views of the general public and give hope to those currently waiting for transplant they so desperately need. We support this bill. We now move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Emma Harper, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Presiding officer, I am pleased to be able to speak in support of stage three of the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill this afternoon. From the outset, I empathise that 500 people in Scotland are waiting for a transplant at any one time, showing the need for this parliament to take this action and support this bill today. As Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee, 
I have had an opportunity to carry out much of the scrutiny of the Bill at Stage 2, and I thank all of those who have provided briefings for this Bill throughout its progression in Parliament, including the organ donation nurses Anne McTaggart and Mark Griffin, who is in the Chamber this afternoon. All of those who have provided evidence to the committee, including the BMA and all the other professional organisations, are welcome as well. As a former nurse and liver transplant team member in Los Angeles, California, I was especially grateful to hear from the people who were either waiting on an organ or those who were transplant recipients. I've heard many pre-transplant stories from patients who were about to be the recipients. The personal voices of the recipients and people waiting for organs was vitally important in helping to inform committee members and I thank all who came to speak to us. It is useful to again stress that the bill's principal aim which I'm pleased the Parliament overwhelmingly supported at stage one, is to bring about a long-term culture change to encourage people to support organ and tissue donation by number one, registering on the organ donation register, and number two, moving to a soft opt-out system. Presiding officer, just over half of Scotland's population have already registered to donate, donate their organs or tissue after death, reflecting both their incredible generosity and the progress made in highlighting the need for organ donors, which is absolutely welcome. However, if we are to achieve the aim of reducing the number of people dying as a result of the unavailability of organs, then we need more people to register. Most organ and tissue donations can only occur in tragic circumstances and only 1% of people die in situations where there could be an organ donor. Given this clear need for more organs to save lives, this bill will therefore introduce the deemed authorisation for deceased donation where an adult has not clearly opted in or out. What this means is that when someone dies and have not made their wishes of, on donation known, their consent to donation would be presumed and conversations regarding Com commencement of donation processes could occur. Presiding officer, the committee received evidence and submissions from some who were concerned that the bill, because of the deemed de consent element of the bill, meant that people's organs would be donated as they had not opted out, but for example, they'd never got round to it. But this argument uh, would assure people that the, the bill includes safeguards to ensure donation wishes of the deceased are followed. The bill also provides a legal framework for pre-death procedures which facilitate successful donation for transplantation so that people are educated and encouraged to make their wishes known. This section of the bill addressing opt-out declarations made by an adult can be found on page 16. Presiding officer, the committee received a number of submissions and indeed heard evidence from people who were concerned about a lack of public awareness of this change in legislation, which was originally a concern for me. So I'm therefore very pleased that the Scottish Government has committed to continuing to deliver high profile awareness raising activity every year as set out, promoting continued national conversation. The Scottish Government's campaign, We Need Everybody, launched in July 16, has been a success, leading to increases in the number of people joining the organ donation register. In conclusion, presiding officer, being probably the only pe uh, person in this chamber who has held a kidney, a pancreas, a liver and a heart in my hands for them to be placed into another person, I encourage all to consider registering to be a tissue and organ donor and to offer this gift to save someone's life. And I urge all to vote in favour of this bill this evening. Thank you. I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much. This bill gives us a fresh opportunity to maximise organ donation to help some of the hundreds of people waiting for organ transplants that can save their lives. Instead of presuming that people do not want to donate their organs after death unless they've opted in, we will now presume they do want to donate unless they've opted out. That change is made within the framework of the law as it stands. This bill amends the Human Tissue Scotland Act 2006. It is evolution, not revolution. I welcome that in this case, not least because I took the current law through Parliament and I believed then that it laid the foundations for whatever evolution in the law might be needed in future. Before 2006, people did not authorise transplantation of their organs after death. They consented to it. The difference between consent and authorization is not just a word. Authorization makes the law far clearer than it was before in requiring 
that people's wishes on these matters should be followed. The 2006 Act also called for a concerted effort to tell people how authorisation works and to explain the difference organ donation could make, and successive governments have delivered that. Scotland, as a result, achieved the highest rates of authorisation in the UK over several years, now as high as half the adult population, although, as others have said, that is not the whole story. The 2006 Act was also designed to enable the further development of the transplantation infrastructure in Scotland. And as a number of members have said, the Health and Sport Committee heard impressive evidence from specialist nurses for organ donation about how that all now works. But despite all that progress and despite our high rate of opting in, Scotland also has the highest rate of bereaved relatives saying no to organ donations and health professionals are understandably reluctant to challenge their right to do that at what is already a very sad and stressful time for those families. So the law should not seek to reduce families' right to be heard, <coughs> nor should it compromise the duty of care which doctors and nurses owe to the bereaved at the time of death. What this bill seeks to do instead is to widen the pool of people from whom organ donation may come. We are, as we've heard, following the lead taken by Wales in 2015, and a similar change will happen in England in 2020. Rates of donation in Wales have now overtaken those in Scotland. The Welsh Bill in 2015 was itself the trigger for increased public awareness, although it took some time for this to result in increased rates of organ donation. But that is now beginning to happen, and the time is right for us to follow that lead. Like others, I want to thank my colleague Mark Griffin and my former colleague Anne McTaggart for their efforts to bring forward the principle of opting, in, in, uh, opting out in place of opting in. And the Scottish Government has now enabled that principle within the framework of the existing law and, as we have seen today, uh, with very broad cross-party support. Passing this bill can help increase rates of donation and save lives, but changing the law will not be enough in itself. Today's amendments have mandated ministers to use this bill to raise awareness, to encourage people to authorise donation, even though deemed authorisation is now in place, and to strengthen further the transplantation infrastructure in Scotland. And we have also agreed that ministers should review this legislation in five years' time, including how it has been communicated. We should also, uh, finally, renew the promise which Parliament made in 2006, that we will give these measures every support to achieve the change that we want to see. But if Parliament needs to return to this topic again in future, uh, it should not hesitate to do so. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Mike Rumbles. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. It is a pleasure to speak in this debate, knowing that at decision time, this panel will, I believe, vote for a bill that MSPs past and present, third sector organisations such as the British Heart Foundation, healthcare professionals and indeed patients themselves have long been calling for. This bill, like Anne McTaggart's members' bill proposed in the last parliamentary session, is intended to increase the availability of organs and tissue for transplantation and therefore reduce the number of people waiting for a transplant. A stage one members shared moving stories of loved ones or constituents who waited too long for an organ and the grave consequences that can have. Indeed, almost 600 people are awaiting a potential life-saving organ here in Scotland. If this bill can achieve any reduction in that number, it's something we all can and should get behind. Under this bill, there are three key provisions. Opting in by explicitly stating your authorisation to donation, opting out by explicitly removing authorisation, and deemed authorisation the default option if someone has not recorded their wishes. In developing this soft opt-out system, we can more easily capture the estimated 80 to 90 per cent of Scots who support organ donation while closing the gap between the number of people who state that they would wish to donate and the number who actually join the organ donation register. As an overwhelming majority of people would wish their organs donated, it can be surmised that many of the 48% of Scots who are not registered donors simply have not got round to opting in. This legislation will help capture these folk who have the potential to save lives by donating their organs and tissues. Of course, individual choice must be protected. That's why this bill introduces a soft opt-out, incorporating safeguards and conditions that might include seeking authorisation from a person's nearest relative in cases involving certain groups or people or specific circumstances. 
deemed authorisation will not apply to under 16s, those resident in Scotland less than 12 months and those without capacity. This is not about asking the family for their views or overriding the wishes of donors. It is about asking them what they believe were the views of their deceased relative. Unfortunately, just 57% in 2017-18, Scotland has the lowest level of family authorisation in the UK. I am glad, therefore, that the Scottish Government took an evidence-based approach to resolving this. There is strong evidence to suggest that legislation like this will improve levels of family authorisation by encouraging frank conversations between relatives about their wishes. Indeed, people living in countries with opt-out systems are between 27 and 56 per cent more likely to authorise donation of their relatives' organs. That has absolutely been the case in Wales, where consent rates rose from 49 per cent in 2014-15 to 72 per cent now, and I hope to see a similar uplift here in Scotland. I am grateful to the Health and Sports Committee for their excellent work in scrutinising this bill and strengthening it at stage two specifically their amendment to place a duty on Scottish ministers to promote an annual awareness and information campaign ensuring regular opportunities for people to make or review their decision to donate or not. And today's amendments also helped. We know the power this can have. Indeed, the duty on Scottish ministers to promote awareness about donation in the Human Tissue Scotland Act 2006 resulted in year-on-year -year increases in people recording their decisions on the organ donation register. This bill will have an even greater impact. And I'm certain deemed authorisation will drive a long-term increase in support for organ and tissue donation. Presiding officer, perhaps even the progress of this bill through Parliament has inspired more people to discuss donation with loved ones. That can only be a good thing. Of course, the ability to transplant is always reliant upon the medical viability of organs, which this bill cannot legislate for. At stage one, the Minister highlighted other work this Government is undertaking to increase the number of viable organs, such as providing funding for new technology to improve patient outcomes receiving liver transplants and increase the proportion suitable for transplantation. That is work to be commended and built upon going forward. I close by paying tribute to everyone who donated and every family that supported and facilitated those donations, saving and improving lives. That is truly a gift, one that this Bill will help bestow on many more untold lives going forward. I now have Mike Rumbles to be followed by Christine Graham. Three minutes each, please. I am convinced that if we pass this bill at decision time, then there will be a greater chance of saving lives. So why was I the only MSP to vote against the bill at stage one? Let me explain. I have been on the organ donation register myself for the last 20 years, and it is heartening to see that a majority of Scots are now on the register too. And this has come about through many measures, not least through the act we passed here in 2006, as previously mentioned by Lewis MacDonald, in which we focus on the wishes of the deceased rather than the wishes of his or her nearest relative. So when I first saw this bill after publication, I was, I have to say, perturbed that the safeguards in it were not sufficient in regard to the wishes of a potential donor. By that I mean that it seemed to me that there was a danger that the wishes of the potential donor might in some cases, some cases, be ignored. There was one phrase in the bill which I thought could undermine the success of the legislation. The bill originally said in section 7 that deemed authorisation does not apply if a person provides evidence to a health worker that would convince, convince a reasonable person that the adult was unwilling for the transplantation to take place. So the evidential bar for the family of the deceased to confirm the wishes of the deceased was being raised and being raised unnecessarily. The Welsh and English legislation does not do this, and in my view there was no need for our, legis our legislation to raise the evidential bar in this way. At some future date, if this had not been changed at stage two, I was concerned that if, even in one case, the nearest relative of the donor could not provide evidence that would convince, and donation went ag ahead against what the relatives believed were the wishes of the deceased, then we could see this legislation undermined. Now, I am very pleased that Joe Fitzpatrick, the Minister for Public Health, has taken on board the point I've been raising, and he brought forward government amendments to alter the bill, which have the same effect as the amendments I was there, and I was happy to withdraw my own at stage two. So now in the bill, if a person provides evidence to a health worker that would lead a reasonable person to conclude that the adult's most recent view was that he or she was unwilling for the donation to take place, that would be acted upon. I, I, I've only got 40 seconds. With this safeguard now in place, I am more than happy to support the bill at decision time and want to place on record my thanks to Joe Fitzpatrick, 
who was willing to take my concerns on board and change the wording of the bill. With only my vote against at stage one, he wasn't under any real pressure to change the bill. But he took the time and he made the effort to get this right. Presiding officer, I wanted to put my thanks to Joe Fitzpatrick on the record, and I also want to thank you for providing me with the opportunity to do so in this debate. Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Christine Graham. Three minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I say to the member that I abstained at stage one. I support organ donation and carry a donor card and would encourage others to go in the register, and much in the bill is commendable. However, three words do not appear in the bill, donation and presumed consent. These have been displaced by transplantation and deemed authorisation respectively, and I ask myself why. I suggest that these are used to assuage any concerns members may have because donation requires the owner of something to voluntarily transfer it to someone else, a gift. You cannot gift if you are dead and have not registered as a donor. Presumed consent is a prime example of oxymoron because consent cannot be presumed. It has to be indicated in some form or other, no matter how minute. The blink of an eye in response to one blink for yes, two for no, that will do. So, in my view, that's why organ donation and presumed consent have been rebadged as transplantation and deemed authorization. The greater deceit is to try and say deemed authorization is different somehow from presumed consent, although Emma Harper transposed the two, and she's quite right. If I consent to hitting me with a brick, the same will result from authorizing you to do it. I will still have been hit by a brick. Consent, authorization, one and the same. Neither authorization nor consent can be presumed or deemed in the vital absence of any indication either way. And in my view, it is wrong for the state to do so on behalf of a silent deceased. So while I fully support the intent of the bill, with regret, I cannot support this legislation as it is worded, just because it's well intended, and I do understand that, and I do want people to have access to organs, but this bill, as it stands, I cannot support, and accordingly, I will not support it at decision time. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call David Stewart. Four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This has been uh, an excellent debate with well-informed and thoughtful contributions from across the chamber. I believe the key point, echoed by several members, was that this is crucial legislation. How do we raise the level of organ donation in Scotland to match the needs of those desperately awaiting transplantation? Uh, Miles Briggs, who's absent from his place as I speak, uh, made a tribute to those on the organ donation register and, of course, their families. And I think he's right to say we need to start a national conversation. Uh, I think he's also right to, uh, to thank all those that give evidence to the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, I, I also believe it's important we do analyse the experience in Wales, albeit it's still relatively new. Uh, and I think, to summarise uh, Miles Brigg, he said, where Wales walks, we follow. I also believe he's correct to say we should also be looking at the provision of intensive care uh, beds. Uh, Alison Johnson made the important point that organ transplantation is a vital development of scientific health care and that there is a will to donate in Scotland as clearly evidenced in polling and of course family consents will rise, but having the wider strategy of analysing on an annual basis, annual basis opt-in and opt-outs are clearly important. Alec Cole Hamilton uh, conceded that before he was elected, his wish uh, for his member's bill would have been organ donation. So I think that was a very genuine point. And he also made the very vital point that the gift of giving is something that's always been there. We always should remember that. And I agree with them that praising the organ donation nurses, which we in the Health and Sport Committee met, were very, was very important. And I think telling the life story of donors is something we should never forget. Emma Harper, as an ex-nurse, obviously has had tremendous experience here. She did talk about the safeguards uh, in the bill for pre-death procedures, the need to raise awareness, and I accept that Minister has taken on board an amendment in this front, and I would uh, congratulate the government for the work they've done on We Need Everybody uh, campaign. Uh, Lewis uh, MacDonald talked about the fresh opportunity to relaunch organ donation. 
and we should, of course, never compromise family rights. We need to widen the pool of organ donation. And that awareness raising needs to be highlighted, as it has been within the amendments, and reviewed within the amended legislation. So in uh, closing, uh, President Officer, I believe the stakes are very high for the success of this legislation. More than one in ten people on the waiting list will die before they get the transplant they need. As BMA Scotland have said, the bill will change the culture and philosophy within society so that donation becomes the norm. So we need to aim for societal change where organ donation becomes an accepted fabric of our national life. Uh, the greatest gift you can ever give is the gift of life itself. Thank you. Now call Brian Whittle. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be closing this stage three debate in behalf of the Conservative Party. And as you would imagine at this stage, it's been a very consensual debate uh, given the topic. And I think, as has been said before, it's a very swift passage is testament to the work done previously by Anne McTaggart and Mark Griffin, who's, who's in the chamber today. I think I would start with by saying that you know, during the Health and Sport Committee investigation, uh, as many members have highlighted and the minister himself highlighted, uh, and quite rightly so, the incredible work the specialist nurses do in dealing with the bereaved family in their time of grief. I know all my fe fellow committee members were moved by the demonstration uh, of a conversation between the nurses and the next of kin and the number of questions, I think, uh, as uh, Osgo Hamilton alluded to, I think surprised us all. Uh, you know, that number of questions is certainly a lot to, a lot to be, uh, to be t tackled at a time of grief. But I think the delicate and empathetic way in which uh, they deal with the subject of organ donation with the bereaved is a testament to their skill and dedication, and we would all want to give them our thanks. I think it's fair to say there was much discussion and debate in the Health and Sport Committee during the passage of the bill uh, uh, through those committee stages. Uh, I, don't, I don't think speaking against the bill, rather the nuances around the bill and its potential implications. Now, far be it from me to, uh, in any way, praise uh, Keith Brown, but I thought I might do, uh, see if I could ruin his reputation here, uh, because uh, he, I was always exercised by the way he consistently pressed uh, for the rights of the donor and that their wishes should be paramount. Uh, however, I think the need, uh, the need for the next of kin to answer that complex set of questions on the deceased prior to any uh, donation will always have that final uh, veto to the family. Uh, I know Mike, Mike Lumbles was, was, was also speaking about this in his closing, so I'm not sure there's any way around that, but I think that uh, uh, I think Keith Brown certainly got us to think, think quite, quite uh, in depth about that. And I think as any healthcare professional uh, will not go against the wishes of the family irrespective of, of the donor's wishes expressed or presumed. Now, as has been said here, nine out of the 10 top countries in terms of transplant data use a form of opt-in. However, I think the implementation of an opt-out system in of itself will not necessarily increase the number of donors. Uh, Spain, as an example, has been raised uh, uh, by, by David Stewart, um, and, uh, as among others. Uh, but in, in what he was suggesting was that in every hospital in Spain, they have a capacity and an expertise in organ transplant. And I would ask what the plans the Scottish Government have to ensure that any increase in organ donation is matched by that increase in capacity. In these days of multiple shortages in staff across many disciplines in the NHS, I want to ask the Scottish Government if it's confident that it can recruit the prerequisite number of specialist nurses in our hospitals and equip, uh, make sure they're equipped with the acute specialist facilities necessary. And perhaps uh, I, I would join uh, David Stewart in asking the Minister if he perhaps address that uh, in his closing remarks. I've also spoken about my reservations in the bill that having both presumed and expressed consent could lead to confusion. I think Scotland has the highest level of card carrying donors in the UK, but also the highest level of family overrule. Uh, Alison Johnson and Dave Stewart again, and, and, and Miles Biggs have highlighted there are 40% of the population who would donate, but haven't yet expressed that consent. And I was one of them until recently, uh, and it was only in changing my address and my driving license that I was prompted online to express uh, that consent. And it took little more than a minute to complete. Now I would advocate more opportunities to express consent because in my mind uh, that is much more powerful, a much more powerful declaration than any presumption. 
However, the bill does offer the opportunity to bring the topic to the nation's attention. I did uh, catch uh, part of BBC Scotland discussion, uh, a radio discussion today, this morning, and that is exactly what they were talking about. So it does work, uh, um, and I think that in itself must be a good thing. I think instigation of conversation in families where their thoughts and wishes can be expressed has to be positive, as Kenny Gibson said. So in supporting the bill, the Scottish Conservative would ask the Scottish Government to run a consistent marketing campaign alongside implementation of the bill to ensure maximum understanding um, and of expressed consent. And finally, presenting officer, we would also ask that an audit of the current number of intensive care beds and specialist staff be undertaken with a plan put in place for that potential increase in donors as a result of this bill. Donating organs is an incredible legacy to leave and the passing of this uh, uh, organ donation bill sees accumulation of many years uh, uh, by campaigners and we would hopefully have the impact that we all think it can. Presenting officer. I now call Joe Fitzpatrick to wind up the debate for six minutes, please. President Officer, I want to thank members for what has been a, a, a very good debate on a very complex and sensitive, sensitive subject. Particularly thank members from across the chamber for reading out those, some, of those, some of those names and some of those statements from people who have um, benefited from organ transplant, because it's really important that we, that we hear those true stories, and I'll hopefully have time to talk about um, some of the stories that I've heard and some of the people that I've met today. Donation, of course, can be a very personal issue, although there are, I think, some differences of view on moving to an opt-out system. I'm sure we all agree that it's important that we do all we can to support initiatives uh, that aim to increase donation. Moving to an opt-out system, as this bill would provide for, will add to the initiatives that have been driving improvements over the last decade and have been leading to that progress which I spoke of earlier. And it's hoped that this change will contribute further to those ongoing positive developments. These developments are supported by commitment um, on the Scottish Government to support and promote donation, but have been driven forward by those who work in the system. And I want to put on record my thanks and admiration for their dedication. Overseeing the, the process, the Scottish Donation and Transplantation Group has played a key role in ensuring that opportunities to improve donation and transplantation are maximised. The group has also provided valuable insight on the bill to ensure that it provides for a system that will work in practice. And I'm grateful for that input and know that the group will continue to play an important role as the new system is implemented and monitored. Miles Briggs, David Stewart and at the end there Brian Whittle asked um, about infrastructure and capacity and the, the Scottish Government has an ongoing commitment to ensuring that the infrastructure supports donation. Performance is continuously monitored and potential improvements are considered via the Scottish Donation and Transplantation Group which as I said oversees the delivery of the, the, the current plan for donation and transplantation um, for Scotland from 2013 to 2020. As part of the plan for increasing organ and tissue donation, the transplantation in Scotland from 2020 onwards will discuss with stakeholders whether there are further initi initiatives which should be progressed to improve the infrastructure for organ and tissue donation going forward. And I think that's very important. Um, David Stewart um, again raised the issues of human rights legislation and I can assure members that we've worked with those who work in donation and transplantation to ensure that we have a system which uh, will work in practice, uh, which um, is also clearly takes account of a per person's rights, particularly under the European Convention of Human Rights. I think Mr Stewart mentioned briefly the Montgomery case and um, the, the, the legislation is in line with, with their, their decision, but that was more about um, the uh, concerned with to medical treatment, whereas this bill is about um, authorisation of donation. I think I want to finish. If, if it's okay, I've got a few points, for, and, and there's another point that the member raised. So the member went on to specifically um, ask about the, the Latvian case, um, Elbert, and um, the outcome of the Elbert case, which Mr Stewart has raised before, turned on its own particular facts and circumstances. And the issue was the quality of the Latvian organ donation legislation, which gave family members a right to object to donation, but provided no mechanism for that right to be given effect in practice. So the, the judgment doesn't suggest that a right to be consulted is a necessary feature of an opt-out system. It simply illustrates that if there is a right 
um, is provided for, it must be capable of being exercised. And that was where the that was where the Latvian law fell short. Very briefly, because David lots Church. of other points. I'm very grateful. Uh, the point I raised was Elbert versus Latvia, 2005 case. The, the case was proved as a breach of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. My point is that if we're having a five-year review, it will be the courts that decide whether there's a breach. Does the minister agree that in the long term that's the best way to proof this legislation? Uh, excuse me, Minister, could we quieten down the chamber, please? I, I, th I think the, the member is absolutely right. I think we are, we are absolutely comfortable that looking at um, the, 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 the case law in Elbert in particular, that we're, we're content that the bill is, is, um, is, is absolutely solid in this area, but he's absolutely right that the five-year review um, allows that, that, that further um, examination. Alison Johnson um, asked about staff training and education and awareness, and I think it is a, a very important point. Training for those involved in the donation and transplantation process will be a crucial part of the successful implementation of the new system. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton asked about psychological support for patients and donor families, at a point that he's, he's raised before. Um, so National Services Division is responsible for commissioning all of the psychological support in the pre and immediate post transplant phase and it's currently reviewing the provision of psychological support across all national, nationally commissioned specialist services including organ transplantation to ensure that appropriate provision is in place and we understand that the review will be completed this later this year so I think that is a, an important point. Um, I think uh, Mr. Cole Hamilton also mentioned uh, support for families, and, and we do recognise the selfless decision um, donor families have made, and specialist nurses do direct families to bereavement services where appropriate. So it's in, but I think it's important to note that for many donor families, donation is seen as a positive outcome out of a tragic um, situation. It's a legacy for their loved ones, um, which can be a valuable part of their bereavement journey. Kenneth Gibson um, mentioned a, a range of other uh, work that is um, improving um, uh, donation and he is absolutely right. Um, I've been clear that opt-out alone will, will, opt -out will only deliver the increases in donation that we all want to see as part of a package of measures. Kenneth Gibson also um, talked about the frank conversations that people should have um, with their loved ones and having those discussions about donation with loved ones will make it so much easier for, um, for, for, for family to, to make that decision uh, comfortably and to have those conversations with the specialist nurses should you die in tragic circumstances um, so that your organs can, can then save a life. So I think it is really important. There's one message from today's debate. Um, I would really encourage um, everyone to have those conversations and speak to um, their, their family about what, what their, their wishes would be. Very, very quickly, presiding officer. Christine Graham um, mentioned and talked about consent versus authorisation. I think actually Lewis MacDonald um, answered that point in his contribution. Um, the, the, the wording relates back to 2006. Um, in closing, presiding officer, um, this morning, I want to go back to, to, to why we're doing this. And this, this morning, I uh, was at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh and I saw firsthand the difference donation can make when I met two organ um, uh, recipients, Jamie and Claire. They spoke of the life-changing gift they had received and the difference it had made to their lives. Um, of her transplant, um, Claire said, waking up like... The waking up, I was like a different person. It's impossible to explain. Even though there have been some ups and downs with my recovery, my life is better than I could have expected. Jamie was equally grateful and said, it's an amazing gift. It's the gift of life. I will never be able to meet the person who did this for me. And I'm not sure I'd know what to say to them if I did. It so completely changed my life. I think we need to remember that that is why we are doing this. I'm so proud, presiding officer, to commend this bill to the chamber today. Like the 2006 Act before it, it will provide the basis for further progress. And I move that the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you very much, Minister. And that concludes our debate on the Human Tissue Bill. Uh, before we come to decision time, the next item of business is a Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee debate on Motion 17529 in the name of Bill Kidd on Standing Order Rule Changes. And could I call on Bill Kidd to speak to and move the motion?
Thank you very much, President Officer. The Commission on Parliamentary Reform was established to look at how the Scottish Parliament can engage better with the people of Scotland and how our work here can be improved to deliver better scrutiny. The SPPA Committee and the Parliamentary Bureau have both been responsible for implementing some of the Commission's recommendations. And the Committee has now identified some changes to standing orders which are required and these are set out in our Committee report but I will give a quick um, outline of them at the moment. First, we propose that the concept of urgent questions should be formalised in standing orders by replacing the words emergency questions with urgent questions throughout the rules. And we are also pro proposing to permanently remove the requirement for par party leaders to ask diary questions at First Minister's question time. This is already happening on a temporary basis. Second, we recommend that the current procedures for committee announcements, which appear to have worked well, should be formalised in standing orders. Third, we are proposing some improvements to the rules on members' bills. In particular, we propose to reduce the time scale within which the Scottish Government must legislate should it decide to block a final proposal for a members' bill. Another proposed change is that standing orders should allow any member to speak on the business programme on Wednesday at the discretion of the presiding officer. This will provide a mechanism for non-bureau members to make comments or raise points on the business programme. As well as the rule changes relating to parliamentary reform, we are proposing some adjustments to the rules about the membership of the SPPA committee. We propose that if a, a member of the SPPA committee has made a complaint against another member, or as the subject of a complaint, then they should not be allowed to participate in the consideration of that complaint. Finally, we are taking the opportunity to propose some other minor changes to standing orders to bring parliamentary rules in line with current practices in areas such as the deadlines for lodging questions. Taken as a whole, this package of rule changes implements a number of the recommendations of the Commission on Parliamentary Reform as well as making several other improvements to the Parliament's standing orders. And I'm pleased to move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kidd. And we're going to turn to the next item, which is decision time. And the first question is that motion 17566, in the name of Kevin Stewart, on the fuel poverty targets, definition and strategy Scotland bill be agreed. And because this is a bill, we're all going to press our buttons. Members should vote now. The result of the vote on motion 17566 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 121. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the fuel poverty targets definition and strategy Scotland bill is passed. The next question is that motion 17615 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill be agreed. And again, members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 17615 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 116, no, 3. There were two abstentions. The motion is agreed and the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill is agreed. Is passed. And the final question is that motion 17529 in the name of Bill Kidd on standing order rule changes be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move to members' business now in the name of Murdo Fraser on the way of St Andrews. But we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs>